Hey everyone, in today's episode, it's myself, Ben, and Dr. T. We are discussing people that want to not partake in some sort of 12-step program. They want to poke holes in things, and they want to tell tell you why this isn't going to work for them. Well, we oftentimes challenge them, okay, if you don't want to do a 12-step program, that's totally fine. What are you going to do in replacement of that? We're looking for motivation. We're looking for them to come to us with ideas. We're also getting into medication, medication management, and what's the proper approach when it comes to taking your medication. We're covering all that and more. Enjoy the show. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? And we got Dr. T. Hey, guys. First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use. And thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message, right, T? That's right. Right, Ben? Right, T. Also, go to Instagram, follow us, Real Recovery Talk Tom, Real Recovery Talk Ben, and Real Recovery Talk Podcast. Podcast. Go there to find all of our latest content. We've really been pumping out the reels lately, and... uh would appreciate a uh, follow there. So, and feedback please. and feedback. Yes, um, yeah. You can find us on YouTube as well. Go to YouTube, the YouTubes. I think I said that, but anyways, here we are. How you guys doing? Rocking, Tom. It's Tuesday. Doctor T's here, scrubbing it up. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, it's National Recovery Month. Pretty interesting. Got anything on that, Ben? I'm glad we get a month. Yes, that's good. Get a whole month. <laughs> I wanted Caught me to, off guard there, Tom. No, I know. I wanted to take an opportunity, though. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, we just received a letter from, and I may pronounce this wrong, Devon, Devin, last initial M. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, who's currently incarcerated. Shout out to you and uh, all the other prisoners. We've been getting quite a few letters lately. And uh, as you know, by now, we did release an episode with Dustin. He's incarcerated in Connecticut, uh, serving an 18-year sentence there for drug-related charges. And um, it's pretty cool, I think, to see the impact that we're having on prisoners and stuff. And, you know, people... I, I I am very open. I've never spent a day in jail. I don't think I would do good in jail. And uh, to see and hear the stories uh, from these prisoners that are in there, I mean, it's pretty remarkable that even we're able to impact them. So uh, if, in fact, you are incarcerated, we want to show you some love. So You know what's cool about it is that there's a few that have found me on social media Because they and they can't see us, generally speaking, on the iPad. From what I can tell, most of prisons you can only get the audio. At least that's the feedback I'm getting. And they they're like, "Oh, we imagine what you look like, (laughs) you know, from your voice." And then they see us and they're like, "Oh." And it's but this it's this whole thing, and we end up having a dialogue through like Messenger, Facebook Messenger, or something. And and it's just like hearing their experience and they've literally had the time to listen to every single episode. It's, it's wild. And I didn't even realize like the impact that we were having. And then when they're getting out, you know, they're actually like sharing where they're at, what they're doing, stuff along those lines. Like there's one guy up in Jacksonville area staying at a, a was out of veterans halfway, if you will, stuff along those lines, just moved on from there. Like, so and he was in. Cool. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then there's John. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So quite a few. Yeah. Um, this Devin or Devon uh, gets out in January in Michigan. So you probably know who you are. Uh, we did receive your letter, and um, yeah, excited to. Well, excited for you to get out, of course. But um, stay in contact with us, and we'll see if we can help in any way. What's up, T? Not much. How's uh how's how how was the weekend? 
Weekend was good. Went to the Dolphins game. Oh, yeah? Did you see Tyreek Hill get arrested? (laughs) I didn't get to see it. I saw the videos of it, but I got to see the game, and he scored, and... Then he put his hands behind his back like yeah. he was getting arrested. Yeah. Yeah, good old Tyreek. You know he has like 15 kids. I don't know if he has that many. I, I think th- he does have 12. I've heard, yeah, like t- 10 or something. Yeah. I don't know. Crazy. It is crazy. I mean, he's a great football player. Um, He is. And then we went to the Hard Rock after. Oh, yeah? We watched uh, Pierre is a big fan of this composer called Hans Zimmer. And he creates music for big things like The Lion King, Gladiator, Batman, Superman. He has like a whole, he's the whole big to do. And so I was suckered suckered into going into that. Pierre likes that kind of music. He does. And when we work out in the morning, he blasts it like the gladiator music. Like if you just listen to the gladiator soundtrack, he's like, I am a warrior. And I'm like, this is so slow. I'm like on the bike. Like what's going on right now? He is a maniac. I love it. dude. <laughs> he's my spirit animal. I've said that before. Like I've, if I want to feel like motivated, I pull up Pierre's Instagram. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> He's like on his 15th workout for the day. Videos the puddle of sweat on the floor. And he's like, I ran 15 miles and did 1,000 burpees. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> have, T, have you heard of uh, High Rocks? I've heard of it. So I met with, uh, or I didn't, I saw Dom yesterday. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was talking to him and he told me about it. It's pretty interesting. And he said it's like huge in the recovery world right now. It's basically the new fad. It's basically all the CrossFitters who their bodies are beaten up and everything like that. Everyone is transitioned over to High Rocks because High Rocks is more cardio based and it's not the heavy weight lifting. How much weight can you move in a fast period of time and get, you know, injured as in CrossFit where High Rocks is more running and cardio and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I was looking at it last night. And it's a set workout, mm -hmm. like the whole thing. I feel like CrossFit is fading out. Well, definitely is going to fade out now. It's just had all it's had it's it's run its course. There's still a lot of diehard CrossFit people, and I think CrossFit serves its purpose in certain ways because I was an avid CrossFitter. I drank the Kool-Aid, so I understand it. But now it's kind of paved the way for other things to come along like high rocks. I feel like it's going the direction of like lower impact, less damage to the body type workouts that are still like incorporate some CrossFit type movements is what I've been picking up on. Yeah. Hey everyone. My name's Tom Conrad. I'm one of the hosts of real recovery talk. I want to take this opportunity and invite you into our Facebook group. It's called Real Recovery Talk Support Group. It's open to anybody. If you're an addict in recovery, if you need to be in recovery, if you're a family member or a loved one and somebody in your life is struggling with addiction, we invite you into this support group. We cover everything. You can have conversations with people. We build community in there, and we want to be support for you with whatever struggles you're going through. We are going to be going live in there periodically. It's already built up of a few hundred people, so get in there. It's at Real Recovery Talk Support Group on Facebook. Yeah, I think it's it's fizzling out a little bit. Well, somebody died at the CrossFit Games this year. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, a guy was on a swim. What was it, A 800-meter swim? I don't know the exact distance. And but... he ended up drowning. Yeah. Yep, so... But anyways, uh, enough about that. Uh, Tambini, you said you had a question for Ben that was going to be our topic for today. So I'll let you take it from here. She asked me if I wanted to hear it before, but I'm like, no, nah, just surprise me. Well, I don't think it's, I mean, it could be a whole topic in itself, I guess. But I recently had a patient who came to me and it was it was our first time meeting. And they're here for alcohol. And they came to me and I said, how's everything going? I always like to check in with people. You know, yes, I care about your medical, but I care about everything in the program because I am a reflection of, you know, the program as well. So if there's something else I can help with, I like to to let people know what's going on. 
So I said, how's everything going? Are you happy? You know, what are some things that feedback you can give us that we can work on and then better the experience for new people coming in? And he said to me, well, I feel like I was lied to coming here. And I feel like I was conned into coming here and I was told this is not an AA based program. I already know. Who and you're talking. I do not believe in AA. So I just don't think this is the place for me. So my question to you guys is, how do you respond to that? Because I'm sure you get that quite often, you know, as a as a medical provider. Thankfully, I'm knowledgeable in AA and, and other recovery programs. So I was able to kind of mitigate that whole situation. But if that were you and my physician, how would you respond to him? So a couple couple different avenues. I'll start off with this. There's only three of us that answer the phone, <laughs> myself, Tom, and Destiny. So I know people aren't getting lied to. Um, a. And I'm also very familiar with how all of us communicate with people, too. I'm, you know, there's no reason for us to hide that. What I generally look at, though, with when people bring up 12 steps in particular is, A, it's it's the, it's proven to be the number one program to help people get sober in all of history. That cannot be denied from a, from a statistic statistical standpoint. Um, with that being said, though, too, I also have to correlate it to what was their prior experience with it. Um, and we are open to all pathways of recovery, smart recovery, celebrate recovery. We're very straightforward about that. If there's something that you would prefer to be doing, go for it, do it. Our, our thing is, and this is me just being transparent. It's the way that I explained it on the phone too. Like the most prevalent meetings around tend to be AA and NA meetings. So as a program, logistically, to be straightforward, there's only so much we can do. We can't have five clients that want to go here, five clients that want to go there, but there's a smart recovery meeting 45 minutes away. Like we just can't do it. It's not the most popular thing around. Um, but going back to their previous experience, generally speaking, they haven't actually experienced a 12 step program. They've, there's a saying, I'll just touch directly tied into the way that I speak about it in meetings. When I tell my story, I tell people the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has become unpopular amongst the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this has come up a few times. I think we even just talked about this. Like if you look at the origin of AA in particular, the big book came out and the way that it worked in the beginning is somebody would write a letter in Alcoholics Anonymous would literally mail them a book out to California, Texas, Florida, whatever the case was. You'd have a guy out there that would get this book, read the book, do the steps as laid out per the instructions. Then their chapter seven, they're supposed to go find a prospect, AKA a sponsee. Now, over the course of times, meetings began to develop as a result, and this thing called the fellowship came about. Now people started to experience the fellowship of AA and how wonderful that can be, but also with people and human beings, what do you get? Drama, opinions, everything else, where 12-step programs kind of lost the focus of the program as a result of people experiencing the fellowship, and AA in particular, got watered down. You hear it in all the 12-step programs, any of them. But most of the time, people haven't actually done the program, and they've been misled by somebody that's been misled. I have that all the time. Personally, I'll have sponsees that have been bouncing in and, in and out. I'm actually about to meet with a guy tonight for the first time ever. He's told me he's been going to AA for, you know who I'm talking about. We visit him in Haven. Um. He said he's been going to treatment for six years, mm -hmm. and I could just tell by the way he's speaking to me, this dude's been going to AA for six years, and he knows nothing about AA. So it's my job and responsibility as an Oh, the kid we visited? It? Yeah. Visited? It? Visited? <laughs> he lives in my apartment complex, and I, on my own personal time, <clears throat> helped him get mm -hmm. some help. Um, but I'm actually going to be sponsoring him as a result. He's not coming to rock. But I, one of the first things I said to him, I said, because he started like texting me some stuff that he likes and dislikes about AA, and I just kind of stopped it right there. I'm, I'm saying, here's how this is going to work, dude. I'm going to inform you of what AA really is and what it isn't. 
Like, and there's, and what I want to tell people is give somebody the opportunity. Someone like Eric, if you've been watching our reels, you know, Eric drops fire. Yeah. 12 step knowledge and people are blown away. Most of the time it comes down to the way that it's communicated. In my experience, anybody that this from the bottom of my heart, anybody that has a problem with AA has not actually done it, has not actually, it has not been communicated clearly what it really is. The meetings are not AA. People piss me off all the time. So if all I'm doing is going to meetings, being around these people that are also alcoholics that aren't working a program a lot of time, they're there so that they can learn about the program, that they're supposed to leave the meeting, then work with the sponsor. It gets messy. Was that too long-winded of an answer? No, I think that it's a, you put it, you put it well. I, my take on that for what it's worth is I think a lot of times people are just flat out lazy and they want to find things wrong with, and I, I'm reluctant. I, I'm, I want to be careful how I word this. A lot of times people will try and poke holes in things so they can turn around and say, oh, I tried that. That didn't work for me. Oh, I tried that. That didn't work for me. And therefore, justify to themselves in some way that they're incapable of getting sober. And we see that a lot with people in 12 step program that have been, you know, maybe had two or three sponsors. Maybe they had a bad experience with a sponsor at one point in time. Maybe the sponsor shared something with somebody else and it got back to them or whatever, but that's not a reason to completely write it off. And I, I totally agree with you. I think that because AA is made up of human beings and human beings are flawed the program of AA is flawed in many ways, you know, but if you can find people and there are far more good AA than there are bad, you got to find those people and uh, latch on to them. To clarify something you just said, and this is my opinion and the way that I present it, there's no such thing as good AA and bad AA. It's actually good AA and not AA. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because a lot of times we know as people sitting here sober for a substantial amount of time that AA worked for us. And we want to be able to go out and scream it from the rooftops and help as many people as possible through the program of AA. But in reality, that's that's not possible But my question to everybody is, okay, if you don't want to do AA, what do you want to do? And a lot of times they're like, well, uh, you know, I don't know. I want to try. I want to try smart recovery. I want to try maybe uh, celebrate recovery, you know, and it's like, okay, have you looked into that? Well, no. Have you gone to a meeting? No, not yet. And it's and I think more often than not, it's out of pure laziness. I'm glad you said, what were we going to say? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I don't want to cut you off No, go either, yeah. but my response to him was like, this is your second day here. And it's not just this program. I get that. I get it in all of the treatment centers I work in. So, you know, m- my perception is, like you said, they're just looking for ways to poke holes or reasons to justify why, one, they don't want to be in treatment or why they don't want to be at a certain place. And so my aim is I I don't meet them with confrontation or our argument because I don't know, like you said, what they've been through or what their past experiences were, but kind of just say like, you have to have an open mind, you know, even if you don't like something or you've had a bad experience with it, like Tom said, okay, then what are other options for you or avenues that you have explored? And if you don't know, then you should do your own research. You know, you should ask people whatever program you're in. If you ask five people the same question, you're probably going to get, you know, five different answers. So you have to one, know what you're looking for and, and what And you may not know that, but if you talk to people and seek help and support and guidance, 
you can find it, but you can't come in closed minded and say, well, I can't stay here because this of X, Y, and Z. You've been here for two days. You haven't even really met every single person in this program and every what they have to offer to you. It's so funny, too, because a lot of times to piggyback off that, like people will say the same thing to me, like, oh, I don't think 12 steps programs. They'll look at me and follow that up with like, dude, Ben, you're so awesome. Like, I want recovery like you. Like, but I'm like, well, I just told you what I did to get that 12 steps. And that's what you're telling me you don't want to do. So if and I'll say this to them, and I'm also not confrontational about it at all, because it is supposed to be attraction, not promotion. Right. I'll tell I'll look at them. Hey, man. If there's a different way that you want to do it, go for it. And if you're asking me for a different way, if I know another way, I'll tell you about it to my to the extent of knowledge that I have on it. But I'm not going to claim to be an expert in every single, I don't know, avenue avenue of recovery. Offered. Like I, I, I just I know, I know a little bit about a lot, but then when it comes to twelve steps, I know a whole lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, and all I have is my experience as a recovered person. I'm glad you touched on the lazy part, Tom. I don't want to say that. And I know exactly the person you're talking about. And I obviously, I was the one that uh, talked to this person prior to him coming here. And I was very open about us. We're 12 step based. We transport you to meetings and stuff like that. Um, So in his particular case, I think it was. Mm-hmm. more just uncomfortability and looking to poke holes in things, you know? And I don't think that he is lazy. As a matter of fact, I think he's the opposite. I think he's going to find something that he does and does it well. My fear for this particular individual is just a too smart for his own good type thing. I think though, too, we should also clarify, keep in mind, like we're a treatment center. Therefore, by default, even, we are required to have all kinds of avenues of of treatment, a.k.a. therapy. Like, yes, in your statement, you said we're 12-step based, and 12 steps is a big part of our program, yes. But if you ask our therapists what we are, if they were able to represent this on the podcast, they'd be, we're trauma-informed, DBT, CBT, EMDR. Like, so, like you said, picking one thing, but we're actually offering all types of avenues from every angle. And they pick the one thing that they don't like. We, you know, for instance, we had an individual, I was just talking about this the other day, who came out, and I love the honesty, dude. He's like, I wasn't in this group, but I got to hear about it, and I was part of the conversation after, but the... Group facilitator basically went around, did like a go around at the very end, just asked like, hey, what'd you what'd you get out of today's group? And the person just looks at it and says, I hate groups. That's what I got out of it. And I appreciate that. But what I pointed out to this individual, just like I was saying, is what parts about treatment do you like? And he named a bunch that weren't the groups. And I'm like, well, let me, what program are you going to find out there that's going to have Every single thing that you like and not one thing you dislike. Sometimes you got to take like, hey, man, to be able to get this therapy with this therapist that I love, I got to sit through these groups that I don't love so much. But at the same time, like if you want to get something out of it, bring something to it. The ones that complain about groups, for instance, I'll turn around and ask them, what'd you bring to group? A negative attitude? Why don't you bring your experience, your strength, your hope? Try to offer something because it's when we give that we receive. That's why I tell parents and loved ones all the time, a lot of times your child may reach out to you and say, oh, this place isn't for me, or oh, I'm not like them, fill in the blank, and it's like, no, they're exactly where they are supposed to be, and like, Ben, you say it all the time, people that get straight A's in treatment tend to fail, and we actually, we want this stuff to come up Mm -hmm. like this, uh, particular person that doesn't like the whole 12 step approach. Good. What do you like? Bring something to the table, you know, tell us how, help us help you in some capacity. And it puts it back on them. 
a lot of times these people, you know, they'll look to us to kind of fill that gap. And it's like, well, no, that's, we're filling enough gaps. You got the therapy, you got the housing, you got all the clinical stuff, you got the accountability, you got everything. This is the only gap we're looking for you to fill. If you don't want to try a 12 step approach, that's fine. What are you going to do? We as a team too take a strengths based based approach too. It's kind of funny. Like I'm, I'm just this coming to mind now. But even this morning, I sat with all three of our therapists and our case manager, and they were talking about one client in particular that's pretty resistant to a, a, a lot of what's going on here. And it was like a dis- discussion about like what what can we do that they are getting something out of it. Like what can we focus on that this person will grasp. Like we sit as a team and try and figure that out. Like they're not into this. They don't like that. What are we going to move towards as a team to get them here and then slowly bring them around? Which they're lucky because I work with other centers and not many people do that. Right. You know, like you said, recovery and sobriety is work. You know, it's hard. We we can't want it more than the patient or person wants it. They have to want it. And, and it takes all of these traits that they are not used to having. Consistency, perseverance, routine, you know, confidence, showing up, being open, sharing, communicating, all of these things that they're not used to doing because, in essence, they're at home and they're using And so all of this is just brand new to them. So when they come in, it's overwhelming. You know, how am I going to, how do I do, like, where do I start? How do I even begin to do all these things that I'm being asked to do? And often, I wouldn't say oftentimes, but a lot of the time in the beginning, we as the recovery team are doing more for them than they are for themselves. So it you have to see that transition where they have to take some type of accountability accountability and have that internal will to start going down that path. A, a lot of the times you got to hit these folks with logic too. A lot of people that are resistant logically want to understand why they're doing what they're doing, in particular 12 steps. People hear all the time, oh, just give it up to God. Like there's so much more to it than that. Yeah. But if you if you take like a logical approach, most of the time, all right, I'll go as far to say, in my experience, 100% of the time, the people that I come across that say they don't like AA or it didn't work for them, I, I bring this up all the time, ask one very simple question. Did you get to step 12 and actually do step 12? 100% of the time, the answer is no. They like got to step three. They got to step six. They never actually completed the whole program. Never is it the case that they've done the whole thing. Even the people, I'll go as far to say, because this happens too. You'll have people that'll do all 12 steps. They'll sponsor people, get these people through steps, have grand sponsees, the whole nine. Then they fall off at some point because they stop doing what got them sober to begin with. They have a relapse after a few years of sobriety or maybe even a few months. They those people come back and they're like, AA works. 12-step programs work. I know it does because I actually did it before. I just stopped doing it. Yeah. There's a lot of nuances to it. But in the end, I mean, there's there's a lot of different things. Like T, you said they have to want it. Yes, they do. A part of you at some point has to want it. And I'm very open about this. I don't think that I'm willing to put more effort in than you in the beginning, but at some point that tide has to turn, you know? You know what I love about this? And I I want to direct this towards you, Dr. T, too. You mentioned earlier, yes, you want to address the clients medically, but you also talk to them about others. To be straight up with you, we Mm -hmm. get like uh, uh, she. you send out an email summary afterwards, and you have to put the notes in when you're done with each client. But we're actually getting a snapshot that looks like it came from a therapist after our clients meet with Dr. T. Yeah. Like, it it really does. And I want to say that oh, how oftentimes do they look for, they come to you, and they're like, I'm depressed. You just need to up my Wellbutrin, and I'll be better. Mm-hmm. I, and I'm I'm asking in a way, I guess I'm insinuating, like, I know you do all this other conversation with them. Mm-hmm around 
the other work that needs to be done besides the prescribing? Like, what's your take on that? Like, people come to you all the time thinking that some pill is going to cure them? Uh, yes. Yes and no, right? Um, you know, there's genuinely some people who are have a chemical imbalance and you know that they do need medication. But the other, you know, 50, 60 percent of people, oftentimes it's the first question I ask them if someone comes to me and says, I'm depressed. OK, explain to me what does depression mean to you? Tell me what symptoms you're having. Tell me what's going on with you like this week. What happened? Did you have some type of family issue, social issue? Did you lose your insurance? Did you lose your job? Like I need background information because just going to a provider and saying I'm depressed. Sure, there's providers out there that will just throw medication at you, but that's not how I work. You have to take into account everything else that's going on in their life and able to treat them whole, like wholly as a whole, the person as a whole. So that's the first thing that I get into. Then the other things I ask them about are usually like medication compliance. You know, oh, well, I did miss taking my, you know, Zoloft or Wellbutrin for four days, but I'll, I'll remember to take it tomorrow. Well, if you are on a medication and you're not taking it regularly and you're having all these things going on plus external circumstances, then we have our answer. So my answer to people is always going to be, will a medication fix you? A medication is never solely the answer. It is going to have to be other things involved with medications, doing the work, working with your therapist, communicating, finding a sponsor, working through whatever happened in group that day, and also co-managing those external things that happen to help improve upon your symptoms. So this, this might be a hard question for you to answer, but it got my wheels turning because I've got that addict mentality. And I, I remember this from being in treatment. You know, if, if I wanted to feel better, I do a shot of heroin and it like instant, instant. depression gone. Right. right? Like realistically speaking, because you mentioned like the regimen and people, oh, I missed my dose. Like probably hard to put an exact number on, but how long do you have to be consistent with taking your average medication before like you get that uplift? Cause it's not instant. It's not it. So it depends what medication it is, but if it's like antidepressants, usually three to four weeks. So it's about managing expectations for the patient. Mm -hmm. Like If you don't talk to them and, and tell them and educate them, Hey, I know what your expectations are. Like you said, you you want an instantaneous fix. Well, in this setting, nothing is instantaneous. And I know that's different from what you're used to, but that's why you're here so we can teach you and guide you and educate you on setting realistic expectations. And when you don't meet those expectations, how do you manage it? So when it comes to medications, that's kind of the conversation I have with people so they know what they're getting into, that it's not going to be an instantaneous. Obviously, detox is is different, right? But like in the outpatient setting that we're talking about. Yeah, on a pharmacological level, you know, I'm no expert, but I just know it's not supposed to be the up-down roller coaster that narcotics do for you. It's like literally mm -hmm. intentionally supposed to be this really – like the roller coaster does, ding, 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 mm -hmm. ding, 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 all the way to the top, super slow. Right, and – People, like, unfortunately, with addicts, they don't understand that and they become frustrated and angry. And it, it's a whole set of feelings and emotions that we have to walk them through. I get that because if you s straight up told me, like, I'm like, I am so depressed right now. And you're like, you'll feel better in four weeks. I'd be like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. it's the end of the world. Like, right. I got to wait four weeks to may maybe feel better. Like, oh, dude, that's why you got to be all in with the willingness and the managing expectations. You put it very well. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you got to be willing to do other stuff other than just take a pill. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, definitely. You have to be willing to do the work and work on yourself and understand emotions. Like, you know, people just throw around depression and anxiety and they don't often know the meaning of it either. 
right? That's why I always say, well, explain to me what does depression mean to you? What what are you feeling right now? What emotions, what range of emotions are you going through and how often are you going through it? Yeah. We've had times where clients have been here, they've been angry, they've been irritated, pissed off, and we would just take them out in the gym mm-hmm. and say, move this weight a few times, do something, you know, excuse yourself from group, go out, work out for five or 10 minutes. And every single time they're in a better mood, there's something to be said about that. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Move a muscle, change a thought. Is yeah. That the saying? That's it. Let me ask you this about medications too. Now I'm like thinking about meds for some reason. Well, we'll talk about it, but, um, oftentimes too, like I remember for myself, like a major deterrent was side effects. Yep. So like there was one, there's one Elevil. I remember personally taking that. Okay. And it gave me the worst cotton mouth, Mm -hmm. but I guess over time it, your body gets used to it and the cotton mouth isn't as bad. And like, but I was like, how, when is this cotton mouth going to go away? And I didn't want to wait. You know, I'm like, screw this. I'm not taking this. I've had cotton mouth for three days. This is stupid. Like expect back to managing expectations. Like when it comes to like side effects, cause normally they wean, right? It depends on the medication. That's a loaded question. I love loaded Uh, questions. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, all of the medications come and the conversation I have with people is with these you know, whatever medication we're talking about, these are the risks of it in terms, including side effects. These are the benefits of it. And these are your alternative options. And this is why. So side effect profiles may not change. Like with Elevil, it has a little bit of an antihistamine in it. And that's similar to like Benadryl or Vistaril. So that cotton mouth, like dry eyes, dry nose, dry mouth may not go away. So there are medications where... Yes, I tell people power through your body should acclimate again, give it a week or two to kind of get used to it and your body should become used to it. And if it doesn't, we'll have another conversation. But there's some meds where the side effect profile is what it is. And I just let them know if if you're having it, the benefit of the medication has to outweigh the risk or the side effect. And if you're willing to power through that and continue with it, cool. If not, then we need to talk about what are our alternatives at that point? I'm like, wow. what's Elevil for? Amitriptyline. Um, it's multifaceted. It, Amitriptyline. My dad's on that. Yeah. So it can be used for chronic pain. It could be used for sleep. You know, it's a really old school. It's a TCA, tricyclic antidepressant. Are those the big red ones? I don't know. What Mine it were green. Like. Uh. And I think they were triangles. But Elevil comes with some nasty side effects, and so that's not that's why it's not so widely used. I only knew about the cotton mouth, <laughs> and in my mind, I was like, "Oh, if it's cotton mouth, it must be like weed. This is gonna work." <laughs> that wasn't the case, so definitely not. So I had something like that when I was on probably about six. No, I was, I want to say a year and a half sober. I went on Wellbutrin mm-hmm. for like five days maybe not maybe even three days it was awful same thing gave me the nasty cotton mouth but they use it for smoking cessation they do still to this day and the doctor gave me because i was smoking cigarettes at the time Mm -hmm. and he gave me wellbutrin 300 milligram like off I guess a, a fast acting one or whatever. No, not fast acting. Or something. I don't know. Extended XL. Ex- yeah, uh-huh. that's probably it. <laughs> Holy shit. That's a pretty big boy dose to start with. I hated it. I called the doctor up I, and I told his assistant, I will die from lung cancer before I continue taking this stuff. And Did I, you smoke cigarettes? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Marlboro Reds, baby. Oh, my gosh. Yep. I quit, Um, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, probably. Yeah. Now it's cigars and nicotine pouches. But Today, he's all cowboy hat and no cattle. <laughs> That's right. 
So, well, well, that was fun, guys. I wanted to ask. This is, I don't know. Those zaps you get in the back of your head from Wellbutrin, <laughs> what are those? Zaps from Wellbutrin? I've never like, I've never heard the zaps from Wellbutrin. I get the, I often get it when people are on SNRIs, so like affects her. If they abruptly stop or they forget, people get like brain zaps, like those like zzz, zzz, or they'll get like muscle right twitches. in the back of my brain. This this part. What's or this headaches. Part? <laughs> Are you on while we return? No, I'm on nothing. Oh, but you were at some point. Oh, yeah. I've been on the, the, the gamut of medications in my treatment history. I've never heard that with Wellbutrin, but with the SNRIs, I've heard it, like I said, with Effexor, and, and usually you hear that with with those, and the presumption is it's because they have have this certain level built up, and then they, they get the lack of norepinephrine is what typically causes these symptoms, but... To answer your question, well, butrin can increase dopamine and norepinephrine, so I guess it's not out of the question. Um, to have I that. did not like that. Yeah, no, I felt like my brain was dying, getting tased. Your yeah, it's like this. Dzz, I don't know how to explain it. It's like in there. <laughs> Interesting. Well, well, that was fun. Anything else? No, I could go on and on about that. That question about twelve steps, dude. I'm just. I get sad when people don't realize what they're missing out on just because they haven't experienced it yet. Or had a negative experience. Or had a negative Or imagine <clears throat> if they had said it to someone, like a practitioner who doesn't even understand like addiction or recovery and really doesn't have business working in the field, that's someone's life they that they have the opportunity to impact and educate on. And that's how I see it. Obviously, I'm not in recovery, but I am touched by recovery every single day. And I'm surrounded by people who are in recovery and I'm a firm believer in it. So I'm able to talk to patients in that way. You know, imagine if it was someone that wasn't like me and they didn't handle the situation correctly. That's one someone's life that we weren't able to touch or change or educate or break barriers with. So, yeah. I wanted to say one last thing that I forgot to say earlier on the topic. I also have to be mindful on the fact that we live in Palm Beach County right. where 12 step programs are amazing. I will share briefly that like, for instance, when I, I went out, when I was in Minnesota and actually this is after I got sober a decade and I'll, I'll go back, I'll find a meeting up there when I'm visiting in the middle of nowhere There'll be like maybe 10 alcoholics and like all share and they'll all be like at the edge of their seat. Like, whoa, we've never heard AA like that. And I'm like, this is like the norm where I'm from. I'm not saying anything different. So depending where you're at to mm -hmm. like there's regionally, there's a big difference between small town USA and like what we have here. Huge. And I got to be open minded and remember that. Like, yeah. People's experiences, different places, especially when they leave treatment, too. Right. Like, I hear that all the time how great of an experience they had in AA here. Then they go home to their home state and they're like, oh my God, this is not the same. But it, that's where it's their responsibility to bring what they learned here and start something there. Yeah. Which segues into our facebook group right where our plan is to maybe do something like once a week where we hold like an open meeting type format for everyone involved so we can you know get people to join our group but as well as us showcase more of, of how we can help people yeah glad you mentioned that because i forgot to bring that up in the beginning mm -hmm. Um, it smells like something's burning. It's rain, right? You smell that? Anyways, uh, d you guys, there's a new stand up sh uh, comedy show on tonight. The debate? Yeah. <laughs> that I can't ought to wait. be fun. I mean, if, like, we have an employee here. I won't say names, but he's like, I'm not even going to watch a debate. I'm like, dude, just watch for entertainment purposes. Yeah. Like, for real. Yeah. Yeah. No matter where you fall on the political line, it's entertaining. It'll be... 
they're saying more people than the, watch it than the Super Bowl. So who knows? But anyways, all right, that was fun. Is that it, T? That's it, Ben. I'm, I'm done. All right, that is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com, and ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see y'all later.